Okay. Hey, uh, again, uh, welcome to everybody and thanks for taking the time today. My hope is that this will be productive for you. And again, my goal is to try and answer any questions you guys uh, have. Um, I will make just kind of a, an opening statement to hopefully set the stage and then we'll go from there. Um, let me begin by first, once again, expressing uh, our deepest condolences and our sympathies uh, for the families and the victims uh, of this just absolutely uh, atrocious and, uh, and disgraceful terrorist attack uh, that happened over the weekend. And so our thoughts are with those victims and our thoughts are with those families and frankly it is a reminder uh, of really just how vicious and absolutely brutal the enemies of Afghanistan are and as you look at an organization or organizations that can just wantonly slaughter civilians out in a peaceful protest uh, it is a reminder of why we're here and the things that we're trying to accomplish uh, with the government of Afghanistan so again our thoughts are with those victims and our thoughts are with the families it has been a couple months since we've actually done one of these uh, events and really that was because of Ramadan and frankly not a whole lot going on operationally uh, or out in the field during both Ramadan uh, and Eid. But there were, of course, several events. And so, number one, uh, we had the U.S. president providing uh, some additional authorities to U.S. soldiers here in Afghanistan. Number two, we had uh, a number of nations that either agreed to sustain their current troop commitments uh, into 2017 or else to increase the number of troops that they will keep in Afghanistan until 20, or into 2017. And then the biggest thing maybe was the results of the Warsaw Conference, where frankly the NATO leadership and the NATO heads of state uh, made some big decisions about the future uh, of Afghanistan and really NATO's future commitment, and specifically agreed to carry uh, and continue the resolute support mission of train, advise, and assist into 2017, as well as to continue funding of the ANA uh, out to 2020. Uh, and of course, on top of that, what we've had really is the ANDSF continuing uh, to really uh, continue their offensive operations uh, and moving forward. And so I'm happy to talk about any of those particular topics, but what I wanted to do just in the opening statements was kind of give you a brief snapshot of where we think we are and where we think the Afghans are on the 25th of July. And you all have heard me say this before, uh, but we do still believe that the ANDSF's performance is better this year than it was last year. And again, I don't want to overstate that. We absolutely recognize that there are still many challenges, that there is still a lot more of the fighting season uh, to go forward. Uh, but the bottom line is we do believe that the ANDSF performance has been better this year than it was last year. And we really attribute that still to three uh, basic fundamentals. First off, the ANDSF has moved from the defense that they were on in 2015 over to the offense. And uh, they are on the offense in 2016. And I know as you guys go out into the field, uh, you may find organizations and units where you may not see that reflected. But institutionally and organizationally, the ANDSF continues to be on the offense. The second aspect is they have continued to change out and improve leadership at the core level and below. And essentially, the ANDSF leadership is looking for leaders who can move forward and are able to accomplish these objectives. And so you do see change and you see turnover in some of the leadership. And the ANDSF leadership has really tried to focus on getting good, solid leaders at the core level and below. And then the final thing is that the Afghans continue to get better and better in the use of their new capabilities. And so what we know is that they are continuing to use these A-29 aircraft and they're trying to pick up the pace uh, of the use. They're using the MD-530 helicopters and they're using those very effectively. They're using their ISR quite a bit and then they're also using their special forces who again continue to be really uh, the best in the region. So all told we think that their performance this year is better than it was last year. And the evidence of that in our eyes is when we kind of look at the way that Operation Shafak essentially the Afghan strategic campaign plan for 2016 we look at how that has played out. And some of you guys have heard me talk about this before, but to kind of review it, again, it started in early March of 2016, and it started up north in Kunduz. And what we saw was that the ANDSF began attacking Taliban positions up in the northern districts of Kunduz, and they did have some success, and they were able to attrit the Taliban so that when the Taliban started their offensive, Operation Amari, um, frankly, and they attacked Kunduz city, uh, they had already been attrited. The ANDSF was able to defend, and frankly, they were then able to open up the lines of communication out into the surrounding provinces. So overall, fairly successful on the part of the ANDSF. 
The main effort then shifted from the north and it went down to the south. And again, our expectation was that there would be a tremendous amount of fighting uh, in Helmand. That did not really materialize, but the 215th Corps in particular was able to take that time. They were able to regenerate and reconstitute capability. And then they were able to move on the offense and they cleared Highway 611 from Lashkar Gah up into Sangin. And uh, again, they were able to clear the highway from Lashkar Gah into Marja, and we now see them continuing to expand that security bubble uh, in Marja. Granted, there was some very difficult fighting to the west of there in northern Kandahar, so the fighting between Shah Wali Khat and really up to Tarankot was very difficult in the month of May, but right before Ramazan, what we saw was that the ANDSF was able to break the Taliban there. They were able to open up that highway, and then they were able to start shifting on the highway from Tarankot to the west into Day Rawood, and they have cleared that and they're continuing really to move further west. And in the same time during Ramazan, what we saw was the 205th Corps began to conduct offensive operations west of Kandahar City, really in the Maiwan, Bandi, Timor area, and we saw some success with that as well. So now what are we seeing? Operation Shafak is now shifting into its next phase, and they have moved up to Nangahar. And we are now beginning to see the 201st Corps and other elements gearing up to attack uh, Daesh down in southern Nangahar and also to be prepared uh, to focus on Kunar, uh, really as President Ghani and uh, the Minister of Defense uh, have both already publicly mentioned. So again, when I look at all that, I don't want to overstate where we are. What we know is the, the difficult part of the fighting is still probably in front of us. And we know that the Taliban is going to they are going to have tactical successes. They will have some good days and the ANDSF will have some bad days. But overall, when we look at where the ANDSF is at this time versus where they were last year, we think they've made progress and we're cautiously optimistic. The other final thing I'd do before I open it up to your questions is I'd contrast that really with where the Taliban is right now. And of course, the Taliban has had their own series of challenges as well. Of course, they've gone through a leadership change with Mullah Mansour's death and the rise of Mullah Habatullah. Uh, not only with Mansour's death do you lose your leader, but you also lose your number one money guy. You've also have continued uh, fractioning and fighting out west with the IEHC still really engaging the Taliban out there. And you, so you see divisions. Perhaps most important though is Operation Omari, the Taliban's really their offensive operation, it started just over three months ago. And if you look at where they are today, they have yet to achieve any of their strategic effective, or, uh, objectives. They have not seized any provincial capitals. While they have certainly contested a couple of district uh, capitals and district centers, they have not been able to hold any of them. And bottom line is they have not really been able to move the ANDSF uh, out of any of the specific positions. The one piece that the Taliban still has at their disposal that has been effective and we are concerned will continue to be effective is the use of high profile attacks. And what we've historically seen is the Taliban does not hesitate to launch bombings uh, and indiscriminate uh, murder of civilians, really because it takes the focus off of what's happening out on the battlefield and it puts it on the loss of these civilians and it brings up questions about where Afghanistan is from a security standpoint. So as we look at the next couple of months, our concern is, and frankly our expectation, is that the Taliban is going to launch additional high profile attacks. And we fully expect them to do that in the major um, uh, urban centers uh, around the country and we'll continue to work with our Afghan partners uh, to address that as quickly as possible. So again, uh, I would conclude that by saying we've got a long way to go. I don't want to try and overstate where we are uh, as of July 25th, but overall and objectively looking at it, the ANDSF has, mo has made progress and we expect uh, with some cautious optimism them to continue to move forward on the path that they're on as part of their larger strategic campaign plan. So with that, Matt, I'll go ahead and uh, pause and open it up for you uh, for questions.
Yeah, J.D., so I think, you know, when I arrived in March, really uh, what I believe we were saying at the time was by December, January, Daesh really had about a uh, presence in about nine to ten districts down in southern Nangalhar, uh, and we were concerned. As you know, in middle of January, President Obama approved and provided authority for the United States to begin uh, specifically targeting Daesh. We think the combination of that effort the combination, uh, frankly, of ANDSF effort, as well as, frankly, Taliban fighting uh, Daesh as well in southern Nangahar, really did begin to constrict the, the Daesh uh, footprint. And so uh, our belief has been over the last few months they've had a presence in probably three districts or so, uh, if you will. Uh, of course, uh, we, the United States, have continued to specifically target Daesh. Certainly the ANDSF uh, has gone after Daesh down there, and we think that Daesh is under pressure. And so you mentioned, have they expanded into Kabul based on this, this suicide attack? And, you know, simply stated, it's probably too early to reach any conclusions based on this one attack. But as I mentioned about the Taliban, it's true for Daesh as well. You see it really, frankly, coming out of Syria and Iraq, where as their terrain gets constricted, you see them trying to conduct more external operations and attacks. And so a suicide bomb against a bunch of, frankly, defenseless citizens really does gain an awful lot of attention for them. Uh, it causes all these casualties, and it gives the perception of insecurity, but it doesn't mean that they're stronger uh, at all. One of the big things about Daesh is they want terrain. That's a part of this idea of the caliphate. And what we know is that their terrain is slowly being reduced. They will absolutely, though, have the ability to conduct these absolutely vicious attacks. And I think that's probably what we saw with this, this strike. Has there been any information regarding where their funding is coming from um, until now? Because I, we were not yeah. clear. Yeah, and it, it's not entirely clear to me either. As we know, we think the Daesh, members of Daesh now, are still primarily former members of the TTP, who have essentially changed organizations, certainly former members of the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, the IMU, and then some disaffected Taliban as well. So those organizations already had funding streams, and they already had funding coming in. So we don't really have a complete grasp of where their funding comes from, but we do know that they maintain um, connection into the larger Daesh headquarters, for lack of a better term, in Iraq and Syria. And I think the evidence of that is, you know, after this terrible bombing, um, you know, the first entity from, from Daesh that claimed credit really came out of Syria. Uh, and so there is clearly a connection, and frankly, Daesh here is connected to this larger global international effort to confront them. And so we think, you know, you can't look at Daesh in a vacuum here by itself. It really is tied into a larger global effort by the international community uh, against Daesh. Thanks. I have, I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Do you say that um, the way you're handling them is effective then? Um, or would you kind of change tactics? And I know you're, you're going to be involved in a new operation there. What exactly will the international forces be doing? Yeah, Phil. So I, I don't believe we will be doing anything different. And so what we'll continue to do from a U.S. standpoint is the U.S. will continue to unilaterally target uh, Daesh and we'll continue to conduct kinetic strikes. Just as a refresher, and I, I think everybody knows this, but the United States, again, just the United States, has the authority to target by status both al-Qaeda and Daesh. And really what that means is once an individual is identified as a member of Daesh, we have the authority to capture or kill them regardless of what that individual is doing. And so the United States will absolutely continue to target uh, Daesh as part of the larger U.S. effort to go after Daesh uh, really globally. Um, we believe that the ANDSF, again as announced by President Ghani, will continue to conduct their offensive operations in southern Nangahar. So I don't know that we're going to have a change in strategy. This strategy continues to be to put pressure on them at every single point and then for the Afghans to really conduct this, uh, you know, these offensive operations on the ground. Do you see them as more of a threat now or do you think this is a one off thing, inevitable? Well, again, I, I think it's probably too early to reach any conclusions based on one strike. They are absolutely a threat. Um, you know, we have referred to them as operationally emergent. So it is still a, 
a small capability, it's still a small capacity. But I think what everybody, the world has seen, is that Daesh has got the ability uh, to frankly grow very, very rapidly. They've got the ability to essentially cause this type of horrible violence very rapidly. And again, it's of course not just in Afghanistan, but it really stretches across the Levant and in Europe, of course, as we've seen as well, and frankly back in the United States uh, also. We don't, James. I'd defer you really um, to the uh, the Ministry of the Interior. They may have something more, but I don't have any specifics. Really, what we uh, what we're of course aware of are these public um, uh, statements by Daesh, both in Syria as well as here in Afghanistan. Uh, I'm not familiar with the cruise rockets, but I would tell you the United States, well, we do use essentially every capability we have at our disposal to, number one, target Daesh, but then number two, to be able to uh, not only target them from an identification standpoint, but then to, to be able to deliver ordinance uh, on them. Well, yes, we are absolutely using everything that we possibly have at our disposal uh, in, uh, in Nangarhar. Mm-hmm. What are the key changes? What is the outcome? You know, uh, sure. Uh, we, we have the threats in Kunduz and, and uh, yes, and uh, the Kunduz is still very fragile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The key districts of the Kunduz have been taken over by the Taliban uh, recently, but obviously it's been taken back by the um, security forces. Um, the uh, district of uh, Zal and the district. Mm -hmm. of Sure. And, uh, where you, uh, and, and fight against the Taliban, obviously, do you have now the authority to have the airstrikes? In one month, in the mm -hmm. last uh, one month, how many airstrikes do you have? Mm -hmm. Give us a number. Sure. Yeah, so let me, um, let me review for everybody again the authorities that the United States currently has uh, and then kind of conclude with, I think, what you're asking about with these new authorities that were provided uh, in the middle of June. So as a quick reminder, the United States has always, uh, as does NATO, have the authority uh, for force protection and the ability and the authority to defend uh, themselves. Every, every soldier does. So authority number one is a force protection self-defense authority. Authority number two is this counterterrorism authority. And again, that is a U.S. unilateral authority that authorizes U.S. forces to target by status members of al-Qaeda and members of Daesh. And again, it really has nothing to do with what they are doing or anything along those lines or really what the Afghans are doing. The U.S. can just automatically target those people for capture uh, or for kill. The third authority uh, is referred to as an in extremis authority. And that really allowed the United States to, if the ANDSF was at a point that they were about to suffer a strategic defeat, the United States was able to step in and provide combat enablers to help prevent a strategic defeat of the Afghan forces. Um, so it was really a defensive authority kind of at its, at its foundation. This new authority is referred to as strategic effects. And the difference is this strategic effects authority allows the United States to be more proactive uh, as well in helping the, the ANDSF as well as more deliberate in helping the ANDSF. And so to kind of understand the use of this authority, you really do have to understand what the ANDSF is doing and really what their strategic campaign plan is. I would contrast that with the counter-terror authorities, which again, that is by itself has nothing to do with anything else going on with the Afghans or any place else. The U.S. can just go after those terrorism targets. This authority has to be used in conjunction with Afghan operations as a part of their strategic campaign plan. So as we discussed earlier, started off main effort up in Kunduz, moved down to the south, down to Helmand, now moving on to Nangarhar. And what these authorities allow General Nicholson to do is to be able to provide combat enablers, primarily in the form of fire support, to those efforts by the Afghans as they move along. You ask, does this allow us just to arbitrarily target the Taliban? And the answer to that is no. Um, so we do not have the authority to target by status members of the Taliban. 
This will sound a little like semantics, but the bottom line is we can target those who are interfering with or impeding the strategic campaign plan of the Afghans. And so that's who we will go after. In many cases, that will be the Taliban or that will be members of the Haqqani network. But we cannot target the Taliban just because they are members of the Taliban. We have to target in conjunction with the Afghan strategic campaign plan uh, as they are moving through the battlefield. Does, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah. Oh, mm. I don't have in the last month, but what I would tell you is really from uh, the beginning of January until really before this weekend, the United States has taken over 450 kinetic strikes uh, in Afghanistan. It's been a mixture of counterterrorism strikes uh, as well as the use of these authorities, be they in extremist force protection, uh, and now the most recent one, the, um, the Strategic Effects Authority. Great. Thanks, uh, in, in recent weeks, <coughs> excuse me, um, in recent weeks, there's been a few reports of um, various relatively high-ranking Pakistani um, uh, commander, militant commanders mm -hmm. being killed in airstrikes in Nangarhar along the mm -hmm. border of Pakistan. Is there any kind of uh, concerted campaign in the way to, to target more of these Pakistani-related mm -hmm. uh, figures? Yeah, Josh. So I would. Um, Obviously, you know, some of the targeting is sensitive, and so I, I can't get into all the details. What I would tell you, though, is this falls really under the counterterrorism authority of targeting Daesh in particular. And again, as you know well, Daesh, most of the Daesh people are former TTP, so there are very strong ties between, you know, these Pakistani terrorists who have come across the border. Our strategy and our philosophy has been to try and keep as much pressure as at many levels within the organizations that we can. And so as we aggressively, you know, look to target these members of Daesh, um, we are looking for leaders and we are looking for facilitators and we are looking for just kind of rank and file guys so that we keep a constant pressure on them throughout. Um, and so that, so yeah, leadership is certainly part of the overall effort uh, in targeting. We're gonna follow up on that. Mm -hmm. um, what would you assess, uh, what's your latest mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and their region, how does that compare to, you know, earlier this year yeah. when, you know, President Ghani was talking about them being followed up and on their heels? And yeah, so I, we think, we believe that they are still probably in the same or a, even a worse position today than they were two months or so ago, three months or so ago. We still believe that they are primarily present in three districts or so in southern Nangahar, so um, Achin and Kat and Debala uh, and those, those areas. So we think they're primarily present there. Again, they are getting pressure from the Taliban that comes in from, frankly, the west, and they are getting pressure from the ANDSF that comes in from the north, and they're getting pressure from the United States, which, of course, comes from the air. We still think numbers-wise, and again, this is clearly not a scientific number, but we still think it's probably between one and 3,000. We think it's probably on the lower end of that, I don't know, 1,500 or so. Um, and we think that, and we have seen some Daesh presence up in Kunar and a couple of other smaller locations, but we don't think that that is because they've got additional capacity uh, or additional capability. Rather, we do think that they're trying to look for other safe havens so that they can kind of reconstitute. We think there's a survival aspect. So overall, Josh, I don't know that there has been a significant change in the last couple of months. Um, we think that these offensive operations by the Afghans will help further reduce not only the terrain, but also the, the numbers of, of Daesh followers. Uh, and so, um, yeah, does, does that kind of answer the question? Okay. And in, and in, sorry, has, mm -hmm. is there any kind of cooperation from the Pakistani side of things, especially now that, you know, they are launching these big operations right along mm -hmm. the border there? I mean, that area where Daesh is is, again, mm -hmm. right there on the border. Is there any kind of official cooperation from the Pakistani side to, you know? Well, I, I really would kind of refer you to the Pakistanis, but I know the chief of the general staff, General Raheel, you know, right after uh, the Eid time frame was uh, in the FATA, and he made some very public statements that uh, the Pakistanis will not use or not allow their soil to be used to attack uh, Afghanistan and that they've made orders to their agencies to continue uh, that effort uh, with it. And so uh, we, you know, as you've heard me say before, and this remains true, at the end of the day, 
these issues of terrorism are regional issues, and they absolutely require not only Afghan participation, but Pakistani participation, and certainly international community uh, participation uh, at all points and in all locations to be able to address these threats. But there's no kind of operational coordination that you know of as far as you know, specifically with these operations? I'd have to defer you to either the government of Afghanistan or Pakistan and whether on how they're coordinating that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. So first off, again, I think it's really too early to come to any specific conclusions about uh, really about exactly what transpired. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I, I don't want to sound like I'm dodging the question, but simply stated, having a couple of people that you've hired put on a suicide belt and sneak into a crowd of many thousands uh, really is not that sophisticated, if you will. Uh, it, there, is, there is clearly going to be risk, and we see it not only in Afghanistan, but as we've seen recently, we see it in Europe, and we see it in the United States, where these types of uh, attacks can occur. Uh, and it is very effective, and it certainly takes the pressure off, and it takes the, the world's view off of the actual terrain that they hold, and this caliphate idea, and really kind of the losses that they're suffering, be it here, or frankly, be it in Iraq uh, and Syria. And so these are, and that's our concern, these high-profile attacks, they are effective uh, because they're not, that, they're not that difficult to achieve. They certainly cause uh, a lot of interest and a lot of focus, um, and, uh, but they do kind of hide a, a, a larger weakness. And so, again, we don't believe that we are seeing them spread right now uh, up the northeast part of the country. Uh, I think what we will continue to see, though, is frankly the use of high-profile attacks, be it by Daesh or be it by the Taliban, uh, to really kind of take the, the world's view off of what's happening out on the battlefield and kind of these larger efforts. Um, if I'm not mistaken, there have been reports about uh, single drone strikes in Kunduz. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose the drones were military and not from the CIA. So uh, is this something, because as, at least as far as I can uh, tell, drone strikes mm -hmm. weren't uh, in the north before. Is this something we are going to see in the future, mm -hmm. uh, only in Kunduz or maybe also in other places mm -hmm. as, let's say, Badakhshan? Yeah. So the U.S. does conduct strikes uh, for, again, as I mentioned earlier, kind of using every asset that we can. As under this new strategic effects authority, again, part of the idea is to be able to support this larger offensive national campaign plan by the ANDSF, again referred to as Operation Shafak. Since Kunduz is a big part of that, we absolutely do try and continue to assist the Afghan efforts, uh, the ANDSF efforts up there. And so if opportunities present and if there is a requirement and a need for it, uh, we have taken strikes uh, and we will take strikes up in the Kunduz area. But you can't specify that, like, uh, if this is like more drones, or uh, as in the past, it has been more uh, conventional airstrikes. Yeah. Um, uh, but you can't talk on this if it will be like uh, drones operations also increasing in the north. No, and, and I, I don't, I, there was, there's probably not a specific decision on the type of weapon system or platform. It's really what is available at the time and what fits the requirement. Each of these capabilities provides pros and provides cons to it. And so you really want to try and identify what the target is, what the requirement is, and then determine what's the best asset to apply that. So in some cases, it will be unmanned aircraft. In other cases, it will be manned aircraft. Uh, and it'll really depend on the circumstances at the time. Thanks. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, JD. So by kind of definition, these counterterrorism operations are fairly sensitive, uh, and we do have a desire to protect not only the missions that you know that the counterterrorism forces are conducting, but the ways that they're conducting uh, that information. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of detail for you on that tonight or today. Okay. Well, hey, uh, as always, uh, once again, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I would encourage you, if these forums are effective, please let me know. If they're not effective, if there's a better way to get you information, please let me know that as well. And, and we're, of course, happy to do all that. Yeah, another question? Yeah. On that note, yeah. um, as part of the question, but also, mm -hmm. I mean, is there, in the spirit of transparency and being open with you know, the American public and mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in terms of you know, what airstrikes are being carried out, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is I don't know. To this point, I, I mean, obviously, because we're kind of doing this, Josh, would hopefully communicate to everybody that we do want to be transparent with these operations and we do want to inform the public of what's happening, always being mindful, of course, of trying to protect the operational security of not only the mission itself, but of the people. And, and in my experience in this country, what I have seen over and over again, frankly, is that the Taliban reads your reporting. They, they do. They learn from it, they improve their TTPs, and they get better. And so we always want to balance what it is, of course, we're putting out with that fact that the Taliban does absolutely read and listen to what y'all say, and they get better with it. Uh, in terms of daily operational uh, updates, um, not opposed to that at all historically, or up, I say historically, up to this point since I've been here, there's not the volume of activity to justify that. It's, you know, it, uh, while you see a bunch of different, you know, uh, speculation of this event and that event, there's just not, frankly, enough to, to really put out on a daily basis. But, I mean, it's something that we can absolutely engage uh, and consider, uh, and, or reconsider, really, to take a look and see is there really enough information and material to have on a daily basis. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you, no, you raise a good point. You absolutely do. And one of the things that, to, again, that we consider as we prepare these things is, you know, unlike other theaters where it's really just nothing but kinetics, you know, nothing but strikes and everything else, there's so much go else going on here. Um, you know, the, the bulk of the mission is not kinetics. The bulk of the mission is train, advise, and assist. And again, that's not, frankly, as exciting or or, you know, that's, that's not the kind of stuff that lends itself to here's a daily report. But the bulk of what Resolute Support do, is doing is train, advise, and assist in going. The exception um, or the minority are these kinetic events, if you will, that again are U.S. unilateral uh, events. And so we, we really try and figure out what is the right balance between trying to explain, no kidding, here's what the larger mission is. Going back to your, your comment about transparency to the taxpayers and the public and everything else, the, the public needs to know that really what we're doing here is this train, advise, and assist, and on the side becomes this kinetic aspect of it. Uh, and so we, we do kind of struggle with how do we best communicate that? Is it in a daily roll-up? Do we skew the real story here and kind of the truth and the facts by just saying, hey, we took five strikes today or one strike today type of thing versus all the other TAA things that have happened in that 24-hour period? And so it is. It's something that we, you know, that, that we, we search for a better answer and we search for a better way to communicate that. So. Okay. Now your point's well taken. Your point's well taken. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah.
some analysis in Afghanistan say that the ISIS and the Daesh and the Taliban are the uh, two sides of the same coin. I mean, uh, they are being funded by the Pakistani terrorists, by the Pakistani military. I mean, do you agree with that? I mean, that's why they say that they, they sometimes seem strong. You know, they, they're still, after mm -hmm. all these years, they're still able to capture some districts, and as you mm -hmm. say, the, the Taliban. I mean, do you agree with that? Well, in terms of the idea that there are two sides of the same coin, you know, at the end of the day, what Resolute support supports is this idea of a democratic Afghanistan. Uh, and so when you have these violent organizations that don't subscribe to the Constitution, that don't subscribe to really what the will of the people are, regardless of, you know, an ideology of a caliphate or an ideology of the Taliban or whatever the case may be, at the end of the day, they're both violent extremist organizations that are that are trying to project their will via violence as opposed to via the things that the the people of Afghanistan have agreed to and so yeah there are, there are certainly some similarities from that standpoint uh, in terms of the larger regional aspect you know as I mentioned earlier I think our perspective on it and our position is that these are regional problems. It's not just a problem in Afghanistan. It's a problem for the region. It's something that the Pakistanis have to address, the Afghans have to address, and frankly, the other, or the other parts of this region, too. They've got to come up with regional solutions to be able to address these, again, these just vicious criminals and terrorists.